today the monster I'd like to talk about is the Viper. For those of you who don't know this, this is the exam that comes at the end of any PhD. And what it is, is it's a strange thing. You have two examiners take your thesis and then take it apart. They'll take you into a room, examine you on it, and then they'll rain down question after question, blow after blow. They'll rip it apart, make you feel like a charlatan, and then just as you're reeling on the ropes, they'll shake your hand and call you doctor. <laughs> so yeah, and I like to think of the vibe a little bit like being like trapped wind. It's uncomfortable and you can't get, wait to get rid of it. But actually, more to the point, it's probably a bit like a hangover. Because as well as being painful, it's also self-inflicted. <laughs> and when it comes, you tend to think, what was the point of any of it? <laughs> but if, if the vibe is the hangover, then the research is the night out. It's enjoyable. And I did enjoy the research, and I do enjoy research, and that's why I did it. And the vibe is just something we have to put up with. That's not to say that every PhD runs so smoothly, just like every night doesn't run so smoothly. If we imagine the perfect PhD as a night out, it would be something like you turn up, you stay for the right amount of time that you wanted to, you get the results you wanted to, the next day you wake up fresh as a daisy. It doesn't always work like that. Some nights, maybe you were hoping for a quiet night, but then you somehow end up in a lock-in. Other nights, you'll, get a bit more, you'll have a bit too many, and then you'll find yourself doing silly things. You'll make the drunk calls to ex-girlfriends. You'll be on the phone. I'm sorry, I know I made mistakes. I know I made poor choices. Yes, I know accountants make more money. <laughs> but I can change. I can change. There's always more conversion. <laughs> and then other times, and when you have too many, you get to the stage of the night where you lose control of your language, the English starts to go, your arguments get less coherent and more rambling, and this is known as the writer. <laughs> but the research is enjoyable, and so I should probably introduce you to what I actually did. Uh, I was a chemist, um, so yeah, that's what I did. <laughs> Um, but when I tend to tell people I do, uh, I'm a chemist, typical response is, oh really, Boots or Lloyds? <laughs> but no, that's not what I did. That's a pharmacist, and if this was Breaking Bad, we're the important ones, we're Heisenberg, we're the ones with the product. <laughs> Pharmacists, they're just fried chicken merchants. So within chemistry, the branch I do is called physical chemistry. I'm sure you can tell by my spelt appearance. <laughs> and more specifically, I look at materials called zeolites. These are really important industrial materials. Um, they're used in a whole host of applications, such as uh, water softeners and washing powders. And they're also used in petrochemical uh, industry as catalysts. So they're really important, worth a lot of money. And that's what they look like. Nice white powders which my colleagues, for some reason, like to put into drug dealer sachets. <laughs> and these are made at high temperatures and high pressures in vessels known as bombs. <laughs> so, when we have these zeolites, the idea of my research in particular was to try and understand how these things grow so that we can start to control the properties and get better performance out of industry. And to do this, we use a technique called atomic force microscopy. In short, this is a technique where you take a stiff tip and then pass it over a surface. And it's a little bit like a needle going over a record player. And as it hits a feature, it'll move up and down over it, and you can get information about the surface, sort of like a map. I can just show you a quick image. So this is a crystal on an electron micrograph. And then if we zoom in on this area here, you can see that the crystal surface isn't actually flat. It has details, and each of these is a different height which is a billionth of a meter. So, that's my research. Yeah, four years. I made pretty pictures. Thank you. But, I really did enjoy it, and who can blame me? I spent most of my time dealing with bombs and white powders. When I wasn't doing that, I was getting physical with my stiff tip. Through if you're chasing it, I'd suddenly be James Bond. <laughs> but sadly, all good things come to an end, and so it did with my research, and then it came time for the Viper. 
So, yes, I was quite nervous about my fiber. I'd heard some horror stories, and one in particular that my friend said, which didn't make me feel any more confident, was anything you have written in your thesis, they can examine you on. <coughs> now, I've written an awful lot of throwaway like, away lines, the kind of lines that, you know, they're, they're interesting, they're sort of related, but aren't anything to do with the core principles. But it means that I've got an awful lot of research, thank you for that. <laughs> but I've got an awful lot of research to do for this fiber. But what it did at least do is lead me towards probably my favourite paper I've ever found in chemistry. So a little bit of background on this. The names of chemicals and minerals in general can sometimes be quite unusual. If we, for instance, take minerals, they tend to name them after people and places, and so you'll get interesting minerals such as Welshite. <laughs> Or the geologist chat up line, coming tonight. <laughs> and the same thing can happen with chemicals too. And sometimes the unusual names happen pretty much by accident. So if you consider, for example, Pyrrhol. Wasn't too unusual. However, if you substitute the, uh, the nitrogen for arsenic, then what we end up with is an arsenic. <laughs> Further, if we take an arsehole, increase the ring size, <laughs> and saturate it, we're going to end up with arse pain. <laughs> and for some reason, chemists seem to be really intrigued by arseholes. <laughs> There's an awful lot of research, and some of the things chemists like to know, they like to know about the properties of our cells. What kind of properties, you ask? Are they aromatic? Yeah. <laughs> a subject often revisited. just interested in whether there are aromatic properties are. We also want to know what we can do with ourselves. Take for example... <laughs> if that's a substitution, presumably an insertion came first. <laughs> Probably a paper you expected to see in Tahin's set, not mine. <laughs> So yeah, so we have unusual chemical names, and going back to my thesis, as I was studying for my uh, Bible, I was looking through my thesis and I found this sentence. Carbon nanotubes, CNTs, can be used as tips to increase resolution. A sentence now 202 people have read. <laughs> so, yeah, so that's what I've written. And I thought, I'm going to have to revise everything to do with carbon nanotubes. So I researched everything, trawled the internet, and I came across this beautiful paper by this Chinese group. And what they've done is they've made nanotubes out of two different elements. So if we take carbon nanotube, the first element is... <laughs> As I said, two elements, and the second one they chose, yes, I'm sure you've guessed it by now, they chose copper. <laughs> so, copper nanotubes, and this is a genuine figure from that research paper. <laughs> My vibe comes. I'm on the lost English knowledge. I'm feeling confident and I go into the room. And then the examiners appear and they bamboozle me because they don't want this niche knowledge. No, what they want are the underlying fundamental principles of my research. Shit. <laughs> stuff I didn't know, it's just because I spread the, the revision so widely and, and the nerves of the day, everything just went straight out of my head. I was a floundering wreck. And that's when we got on to first year thermodynamics, my favourite topic. And the examiners wanted 
to ask some fairly simple questions, straightforward ones, and my mind was absolutely blank. This was made worse by the fact that six months ago I'd been teaching this stuff. <laughs> it's just stuff I did know though, and it's just the nerves of the situation got the better of me, but the examiners presumably were trying to help me, feeding me bits and bits, but as they fed me the information, nothing was sticking. I couldn't get anything, and they were peering over expectantly at me, and I was looking back blankly. They'd give me a bit more information, see if they could tease anything out, looking expectantly, like nothing. And I was there panicking, rooting around in my brain, and so at that moment, only one thing came to my mind. Copper nano tubes. <laughs> Thank you very much.